Liturgy is the work of the people. We work together as the seven congregations, the United Church of Canada who have formed the Virch experience or experiment, this ongoing way of doing the work of the people together. We often remark, those of us who are part of the planning and leadership of Virch, that there's a remarkable energy that evolves every week. And somehow from diverse places and experiences, um, we each share our piece of the puzzle and somehow there's a, a wholeness that emerges. And that is uh, evidence of a spirit, a common spirit and, uh, and a Holy Spirit flowing through our communities. Each week, we, all of us, don't know where the world is going either. And so we prepare liturgy, we prepare a work of the people that is open to the events that may or may not um, occur. I'm sharing this, these words of welcome for today's service for January 24th, uh, but between the time I'm sharing them and, uh, and Sunday, the inauguration of, uh, of a new president uh, will unfold in the United States, other events in the world, such uncertainty in so many of our lives. And yet we continue to craft a work of the people. And we do that together. And so I welcome you into this time. And I, I welcome you from the place where you find yourself this day. We all, in, a, in, in new and renewed ways, are spending more and more time in our own homes. This is a, an occasion for me to be here at the church to do some work and prepare for, for Sunday. In so many ways, the work continues. In so many ways, the work thrives as we continue to attend to one another spiritually as we listen for God's Spirit in our world. So welcome. Listen for God's Spirit as, uh, as the leadership of Virch share in gifts of word and music, of scripture and prayer. Welcome. Eternal and loving God, Grant us a trustworthy vision of a just world that we can believe in. Blessed Jesus, teach us lessons that stand the test of time and the trials of struggle. O Holy Spirit, lift us on the wind, fill us with confidence, sustain us as we face ourselves, and reach out to each other as vessels of good news. Amen. Being a fisher or fish plant worker is not just something you do. It's the very thing that you are. It's you, and you are it, just like faith. The prayer I have written is written from the first person, inspired by the fisher friends I know reflecting the paradox of being community and being isolated all at the same time. Being a fisher can be lonely work, just like fishing villages can be lonely places. I hope these words speak to you. Let us pray. God, are you listening? Can, can you hear me? This is a confusing time. Every day looks the same, but not every day feels the same. And so I'm not sure what I should be doing. And so sometimes it's hard for me to know how to be. Can you help me with this, please? Come into my soul, God, the one you created in the image of a just and loving world. Come into my heart, God the one you fashioned to be loving and courageous and compassionate. Be in my life, God, the one Jesus calls me to live. Thank you for listening. Feel better. 
feel less alone and more patient. Work in me and I will be ready to reach out to someone who needs an ear, a shoulder, or something more when the time presents itself. I wish to be blessed. And I wish to be a blessing. Amen. Good morning, friends. It's wonderful to see you again. Have you had a good week? Has anything interesting happened to you this week? This week, my dear ones, I want to talk about names and the different names that we have. I wonder, do you have a special story about where your name came from? I'll tell you my name story. My name is Molly. And when I was born, there were two of us. I'm a twin. And so there was myself and my sister. And my parents had names picked out for each of us. But when I was born, because I was a twin, I was teeny tiny. I was a very, very little baby. I was only four pounds when I was born. And so the name that my parents had chosen for me before I was born was Jennifer. And then when I was born, so teeny tiny, and my parents say that I was really feisty. It meant that I had a lot of energy. When they met me, they thought, oh, Jennifer is far too big a name for this teeny tiny baby. We're going to call her Molly because that's a fast name. And she seems like a little person who has a lot to do in her life. So my name became Molly Bell. That was a name that I could say fast and then I could get on with things. And that's how I got my name Molly. And that's why my name is not Jennifer. Do you have a story about where your name came from? You could ask your big people. Maybe you have special middle names in your name. Or maybe there's a story about the last name that you have and where that came from. It would be really interesting this week for you to talk to your big people and find out the stories of where your name came from or where their names came from, that's always so interesting. I wonder where the name for God came from. Because you see, there are lots of names for God. What? I know, it's not just God. There are all sorts of names that people call God. And today in our worship service, we're going to talk about names and what it is to be called by a name and have God call us by name. So I thought we could think about God's different names. Now, I have a wonderful book to share with you, and I'm so thankful to my friends Emmy and Grayson, who shared this book of theirs with me so I could share it with you. And it's called In God's Name, and it's a book by Sandy Eisenberg Sasso, and this book talks about different names for God. So I would love for you to cuddle up with your big person and listen to how many different names for God that you can hear in this story. And then we'll come back and we'll talk about it together. So settle in and let's listen for all the different names for God. In God's Name After God created the world, all living things on earth were given a name. The plants and the trees, the animals and the fish, and each person young and old had a special name. But no one knew the name for God. So each person searched for God's name. The farmer whose skin was dark like rich brown earth from which all things grew called God source of life. The girl whose skin was as golden as the sun that turned night into day called God creator of light. The man who tended sheep in the valley called God shepherd. The tired soldier who fought too many wars called God maker of peace. The artist who carved figures from earth's hard stone called God, my rock. Sometimes the people who called God by different names were puzzled. 
They said every living thing has a single name: the marigold, pansy, and lily, the oak tree, sequoia, and pine. God must have a single name that is greater and more wonderful than all other names. Each person thought their name for God was the greatest. Each person thought their name for God was the very best. The farmer who called God source of life said, "This is the true name for God." The girl who called God creator of light insisted, "This is the most splendid name for God." The shepherd, soldier, and artist believed they each had the perfect name for God, but no one listened, least of all God, and so each person kept searching for God's name. The woman who cared for the sick called God healer. The slave who was freed from bondage called God redeemer. The grandfather whose hair was white with the years called God ancient one. The grandmother who was bent with age and sorrow called God comforter. The young woman who nursed her newborn son called God mother. The young man who held the hand of his baby daughter called God father. And the child who was lonely called God friend. All the people called God by different names. They tried to tell one another that their name was the best, the only name for God, and that all other names were wrong. But no one listened, least of all God. And so each person kept searching for God's name. Then one day, the person who called God ancient one. And the one who called God friend, the one who called God mother, and the one who called God father, all the people who called God by a different name came together. They knelt by a lake that was clear and quiet, like a mirror, God's mirror. Then each person who had a name for God looked at the others who had a different name. They looked into God's mirror and saw their own faces and the faces of all the others, and they called out their names for God: Source of Life, Creator of Light, Shepherd, Maker of Peace, My Rock, Healer, Redeemer, Ancient One, Comforter, Mother, Father, Friend. All at the same time. At that moment, the people knew that all the names for God were good, and no name was better than another. Then, all at once, their voices came together, and they called God one. Everyone listened, most of all, God. What did you think of our story today? Did you hear all sorts of different names for God? Were there ones that you recognized? I bet that you've heard us refer to God as Father or as Mother before. You've heard that when we do our Lord's Prayer together and we say "Our Father" or "Our Mother who art in heaven." Are there other ones that you recognized? I'm sure lots of the grown-ups will recognize talking about God as a shepherd, somebody who looks after sheep. Are there ones that you didn't recognize? I'm looking at the book right now and looking at some of the different names. What about hearing God referred to as my rock? Does that sound interesting to you? What about God as the creator of light? Isn't that a beautiful term? We heard a bunch of different names for God. I'm going to count right now: one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve names, plus the one at the end when people called God one. So that would make thirteen different names that we heard of God. I have a list somewhere else that has ninety-nine different names for God. Can you believe that? And you know what? I bet there are even more than ninety-nine. 
You see, when we get to know God and when we have God in our hearts, our relationship with God is so special, it's so unique that lots of us have different names. And it doesn't really matter what you call God or what I call God, if they're different or if they're the same. It's okay because we know that we're all talking about the same God. And maybe we have friends who call God by different names. Maybe even friends who are different faiths, who talk about a, a, a higher power, a bigger, a bigger power, a, a big presence in the universe by different names, not the ones that we choose to use. And that's okay. See, God is so big that one name just isn't enough. And 13 names isn't enough. And 99 names isn't enough. And God is so big that we can use all sorts of different names to talk about God. And they're all right. And they're all good. Because we're talking about that power that is bigger than us. We're talking about that being who loves us so much. We're talking about that strength that we have when we don't think we can do any more. And then we get that power to be able to do something else. Or that feeling that when we're really sad and lonely, and then we remember that we're not alone. So all different ways that we get to know God. And we, as Christians, get to know God through stories about Jesus. When we hear the kind of person Jesus was, how he looked after people, how he was kind to people, how he made sure everyone was taken care of, we get to know God that way. I think it's important, especially at a time when some people want to tell us that there's only one way for us to know God, to remember that God is so big that all the names we have for God are good and right. Maybe what we could do is have a prayer together and say thank you to God for all the different ways that we get to know God. Let's do that. Cuddle up with your big person and let's have a prayer together. Dear God, you are humongous. You are so big that you need lots of names. Whatever name we call you and whatever name others call you, help us remember that you are one, that you are ours, and that you love us very much. We love you, God. Amen. My dear ones, maybe this week what you could do is try to find an unusual and creative name for God. If you come up with a really cool name for God, let me know. I would love to hear it. Maybe the big people might want to explore some of the different names or images for God. You can use the computer and do that really easily. Find some of the different names and images that God has been represented with over the centuries. And remember, I have that one other piece of homework for you, that jumping homework. I need you to send me videos and pictures of you jumping because at the beginning of February, on February 7th, we're going to have a great piece of music with all sorts of jumping pictures and jumping videos. You're going to love it. Dear ones, just like God is wonderful and all the names for God are wonderful, you and your special name are wonderful. God looks at you and thinks, oh, what an amazing person you are. So find out some different stories about your name, about other people's names. Find out some different names for God and have a great week, my friends. God loves you so much and I love you too. Have a wonderful week. Bye-bye.
Let us pray together. In ancient words, we find truth for today. Songs of long ago give voice to our feelings. Phrases of ancestors in faith express our own experiences. As communities of faith in our time and in our days, with all of the challenges that we face, we acknowledge that this is a time for reflection. This is a time of inspiration. This is a time of determination. This is a time to set out in a new direction for the benefit of others, for the benefit of our local and even worldwide community of which we are all a part. May you, our most just and loving God, bless our receiving of the word and our interpretation of its wisdom for the days in which we live and serve you. Amen. Our reading today is from Mark, chapter 1, verses 14 to 20. After John was arrested, Jesus went to Galilee and told the good news that comes from God. He said, the time has come. God's kingdom will soon be here. Turn back to God and believe the good news. As Jesus was walking along the shore of Lake Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew. They were fishermen and were casting their nets into the lake. Jesus said to them, come with me, I will teach you how to bring in people instead of fish. Right then, the two brothers dropped their nets and went with him. Jesus walked on and soon saw James and John, the sons of Zebedee. They were in a boat mending their nets. At once, Jesus asked them to come with him they left their father in a boat with the hired workers and went with him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I recently read this little gem of a book called Wintering, The Power of Rest and Retreat in Difficult Times by Catherine May. The author traces her journey through the months of winter, one at a time, providing insight and wisdom along the way. Now, as someone who struggles with winter and all that it brings, I appreciate the call of this book to stop avoiding or escaping winter, to stop feeling challenged by it, and to begin to lean into it and embrace its gifts. Winter provides permission to stop in many ways, to hibernate as many mammals do, and to attune our hearts and lives with the slower pace of the cold, dark months. We begin this process in Advent as the light begins to diminish and the temperatures drop May describes a sort of call of the wild, a primal call to our senses and sensibilities at this time of year. I would describe what May counsels as attending. Attend to the little things. Attend to your own needs and well-being. Attend to your home, to your loved ones. Snuggle in, get cozy attend. May offers an anecdote about a dormouse in hibernation. Apparently dormice do not sleep uninterrupted all the way through the winter as many of us have been taught. They awaken every 10 days or so to rev up their circulation and their major organs to relieve themselves and then to look around and make sure that everything is okay. Then they go back to sleep. For that is their work during winter time, to rest deeply and conserve their energy for a coming season. This image of a dormouse in hibernation, occasionally waking up to make sure that all is okay, 
has me reframing our current lockdown situation as a doubly wintry invitation to deep rest. May invites us to lean into winter, indeed to winter as a verb, and receive the gifts that slowing down and attending bring. This morning's story in Mark also comes with an invitation to attend. James and John, the second pair of brothers Jesus calls, are in their fishing boats. And then along comes Jesus and sees that they are mending their nets. They were mending their nets. Apparently, in fishing communities, it is understood that taking time to mend the nets, or more precisely, to tighten the nets so that the fish don't fall out of the holes, is a big part of taking good care of the boat. Caring well for the equipment ensures that those who fish for their living are prepared for whatever may come at sea. The act of mending the nets is a vital part of that preparation. Mending the nets, therefore, is a metaphor for getting ready. James and John had been getting ready for what was to come, and what came was Jesus' invitation to follow him. Jesus called to them, and leaving their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men, immediately they left the boat and followed Jesus. What this suggests to me is that they were well prepared to receive that call. Now, Barbara Brown Taylor calls this story the miracle on the beach. And she characterizes the fisherman's response as spontaneous. Other interpretations insist that no one just simply drops their nets and follows without some measure of preparation. I think it's both. Deep preparation had been going on that readied the men for the moment when Jesus would ask them to follow him seemingly spontaneously, and then they chose to do so. Jesus' new disciples heard and answered at least two calls. The first was a call to attend and to get ready. The second was a call to drop their nets, the very symbol of their livelihood and identity, and follow Jesus. The first preceded the second. That is, the first was necessary for answering the second call with such an emphatic yes. Now, we know that God calls us to mend the world, to love the world as God loves it, and to seek justice and resist evil. Sometimes, responding to that call involves marching, voting, writing letters, engaging on social media, and speaking up. It involves outward engagement, outreach, activation. Yet, sometimes answering that call, that call to justice and to mend the world and love the world, that call means attending to what's in front of us, to what needs doing in our immediate circle of influence. Sometimes, as in the season we are living right now, when we are bone tired, weary, and more anxious than usual, the deep call is to winter, to hibernate a little, and to attend well and care. Now, it is said that God is in the details. Well, at times, how we mend the world is by mending one net at a time.
one relationship at a time, one response at a time. And when life is unpredictable and our daily routines and our jobs and our health and our freedom to move about in the world are impacted by the realities of virus and contagion, it's helpful to focus on what or who is right in front of us for a time. And these choices to care and respond well ripple outward. It's important and hopefully encouraging when we feel overwhelmed and powerless by all that we've been living to remember the power of this ripple effect. We are not wasting our time and we are not wasting away. We can choose to live into this lockdown winter with care and attention, trusting in the spirit, trusting in the divine call that will come, trusting that spring is coming. I will say it again. When we choose to mend our nets close to home, to dig deep and reconnect to God and our heart center, that effort ripples outward and it gets us ready for the moment that comes and to say, yes, God, I will follow you. Yes, I will do this new thing. Take that risk, speak this big truth, work for justice and systemic change. But for now, in this winter time of life, when we are weary and in need of deep rest, it's time to mend our nets. It's time to attend to matters close to home and close to our hearts as a way of increasing our capacity to respond globally and justly. When we take good care of things and people, of our relationships with each other, we increase our capacity to extend that care further afield. Collectively, we are preparing ourselves to engage the work of mending the world. Mending our nets leads to mending the world, one ripple at a time. In his gospel, Luke reports that Jesus said, if we are faithful in little, we are faithful in much. In the coming months, let's winter together even while physically apart from those outside our bubbles. And let's attend well to what is in front of us right now, so that when God calls us to mend the world in a more visible way, we can respond immediately and without reservation. Let's be prepared for what God might ask of us. Let's mend our nets and care for one another. Let's care for our communities of faith, our neighborhoods, and for the neighbors we don't yet know by name. Let's winter together, checking in on each other every so often to make sure that everything is okay so that when we get ready together, we will be ready when God calls us into action. For that divine call is right around the corner. I hope that having wintered and prepared well together, we will hear the unique call of God to our communities and together we will say, yes, God, we will follow you. People of God, it's winter time. Let's get ready.
spoken my name. Now my boat's left on the shoreline behind me. By your side, I will seek other seas. You know so well my pulse. smiling have spoken my name now my boat's left on the shoreline behind me by your side I will seek other seas you need my hands full of carry through my legs other oceans ever long for by souls who are waiting my loving friend as us you call me oh Jesus with your eyes you have searched me and while smiling have spoken my name now my boat's left on the shoreline behind me. By your side, I will seek other seas. Gracious and guiding God, Watch over us, even though we know you are beneath us, between us, behind us, in all that we do, in all that we are. May your love guide us in paths of compassion, of skill, of ingenuity, of creativity, as we seek to follow your ways in these difficult times. We thank you for the frontline workers, for the nurses, the doctors, all the healthcare professionals who are guiding us and caring for us during these times of COVID tide. Of course, other things are happening at the same time too. And we pray for all of those who are suffering from other illnesses, those who are lonely, those who are suffering from invisible illnesses, mental health issues, addiction. God, we pray out of thanksgiving and joy as well for food, for water, for shelter, for the relative safety that we live in, in our city of Ottawa. Gracious God, we gather these prayers and we send them to you, just as we send these silent prayers of concern and supplication as well.
And we pray as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Get ready, there's a train a coming. You don't need no baggage, you just get on board. All you need is faith to hear the diesels humming. You don't need no ticket, you just thank the Lord. Get ready, there's a train to Jordan Picking up passengers, coast to coast Faith is the key, open the doors and boredom There's hope for all, among those love the most And so we come to the end of this work of the people, this liturgy, this day. You've heard good news. You've been reminded in story and scripture, in song and prayer of God's presence in your life, in our lives. And so as this work comes to a, a sort of ending, it is, of course, really a beginning the work of the people, the work, um, the place before you, the place before myself, the place before each one of us, our congregations, our, um, our families, our, us as individuals, we are charged to continue that work, that liturgy, in our homes, as able, where we find ourselves, called into faith and service. So go into the world with a daring and tender love, 
Go in peace, for the world is waiting. And whatever you do, may you do it in the name of that God of love. And now may God bless you, and may God keep you. Go in the peace of Christ. Amen.